Um, today I'm going to speak to you about Albion Archaeology's experience of the Level 3 Archaeological Technician Apprenticeship and how I think apprenticeships have a role in shaping our profession and providing that lasting, lasting legacy. That's so often the theme of our discussions, including obviously at this conference. Firstly, I'm going to give a bit of background about the kind of practical side of the apprenticeship um, and its value to us as an employer and, and to the apprentice and other, other values it might have. Um, and I've got a short Q&A session featuring our apprentice, Chris, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately. Um, I should add that I'm not an expert on the workings of the levy funding and the administration side, but I know that um, Sire and Sister College, as Kate said, are, are here today, so I'm sure they can answer any further questions. And I'm then going to reflect a little bit on education and training and its role in creating a meaningful value and well-rounded profession and also the legacy that it internally is for future archaeologists. So the level three apprenticeship, the archaeological technician one, is equivalent to an A-level post-16 qualification. Um, at the moment, Siren Sester College is the only training provider for this particular apprenticeship. Um, and um, primarily, the um, it's, it's obviously a primarily sort of work-based learning with 20% college-based learning. Um, college-based learning at the moment is done remotely on a Friday, so you don't have to travel to Siren Sister every day. Um, and, other, and there's a couple of field trips as well involved. Um, it's worth noting that anyone with prior learning might be in, ineligible for the apprenticeship. Basically, you can't receive funding to train somebody in something that they, they know already, I think is the, is the way that works. So the first um, cohort of students, including our apprentice, Chris, were taken on towards the end of 2021. And just over 12 months later, Chris had completed his training and moved into the so-called gateway where he prepared for his endpoint assessment or EPA. CIFA are the endpoint assessors for this apprenticeship and their assessors will arrange to attend an excavation site to carry out the practical observation. This element was perhaps the most tricky to organize as it turned out finding a suitable site and time was somewhat more challenging than it should have been, I think probably partly due to the weather. <laughs> However, we eventually overcame this hurdle and um, Chris passed all elements of his level three technician with um, distinction, making himself that he was the first, actually the very first apprentice, archeological technician apprentice to complete the apprenticeship. And I'm happy to report that Chris is still with us and looking forward to progressing to the next stage of his career. Um, there he is looking very happy in the snow. It's wonderful to be that enthusiastic about working in the snow. <laughs> I wanted to give you a flavor of the, the, the things the apprenticeship will learn. Um, these cover a broad range of skill and knowledge, far broader, broader than the normal training offer probably. The question here is perhaps not why are they learning all this stuff, but why aren't we upskilling existing teams and creating a more rounded base for our career entry professionals to work from? Um, obviously, this slide's a little bit small, but we have here things like the role and the purpose of the WSI, how to treat fines, report writing, use of spreadsheets and databases, health and safety, background research, even create databases. Well, I suspect that was possibly a mistake because I think that's far beyond most of us. And, um, so anyway, to, to, to the interviews, I'm now going to play a video um, with a short Q&A with our apprentice, Chris, so that you can hear directly from him. Hopefully this will work. Should, when I click it again, it should all start. Well, perhaps I've got to click it again. Oh, no, I haven't. Um, help. <laughs> Which I'm pressing the right. Have I got to press the mid one? Thank goodness there's a technical person there. <laughs> He's not hired yet. He's got to do his interview first. Chris Patterson, Albion's first archaeological apprentice. Uh, what initially attracted you to the apprenticeship? Um, so I was looking for a change of career. 
um, I was I was working in education before, um, and I wanted something that was kind of completely different, really. Uh, and this apprenticeship offered me the opportunity to literally get out of the office, into the field, uh, try something to learn new skills, and do something that was completely uh, uncomfortable, but in a good way. And what did you most enjoy? Um, really, like learning new things all the time. Actually, uh, learning kind of new skills, learning how archaeology works. Um, what the what the job entails, um, and um, what was really nice as well was having the extra day, um, the once a week at college, um, working with Siren Sester to actually kind of um, almost relearn history and learn what archaeology was through there as well. The combination of the two was really good. Was there anything you didn't enjoy? Um, I started in November, so the weather, <laughs> the winter was pretty nasty that year. And how do you think we can improve the scheme for future apprentices? Um, I think making sure that there's guidance um, around the uh, sort of portfolio side of things um, and making sure um, that the apprentices have like a lot of uh, sort of one to uh, one to one time or like a touchstone with with a mentor. I, I was lucky that I had, I had a lot of that. Um, but I do think that's something that's really important to kind of make sure that people have that guidance all the way through. And who do you think the apprenticeship is most suited to? Uh, I think it could be suited to pretty much anyone who's uh, willing to try something uh, difficult, different, um, and that, uh, that of any age, really. I mean, like I say I was a mature student um, coming into it, and there was uh, there was one other that joined um, similar time as I did. And a lot of the others were um, were either post grad or, or, or post sixteen. Um, and I really think anyone who is interested in a career in archaeology could could absolutely um, could actually absolutely do it. And did you feel well prepared for the next stage of your career? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, kind of working with uh, with the apprenticeship, working with Albion, I knew that at the end of it, I'd be kind of going into uh, continuing working with them. And um, we can see sort of like the, the sort of stepping stones kind of going from apprenticeship and learning into working in the field all the time. Um, and even beyond that now, kind of working kind of to the future of my career. There we go. So that's Chris for you. Obviously, um, nice and enthusiastic and ready to start his um, his, his his career. Um, hopefully, with with Albion for, for for years to come. So he's hired. Now, the value of apprenticeships. Um, overall, we found the apprenticeship a positive experience. The rolling program, which means apprentices can slot into the course whenever they are recruited, really helps. And I think that that's that that's. Kind of helpful for the way that archaeology archaeology works. Um, I suppose the nature of our work means some organisations may struggle with the 12 to 18 month commitment, though perhaps we're perhaps we're a bit too quick to give out short term contracts. I mean, I know it can't be helped sometimes because of the way work is, but perhaps we do need to make more of a of kind of financial commitment, commercial commitment to our to our team. Um, the apprenticeships obviously have a value to the apprentice, the people they work with. Um, I think everybody um, enjoyed in our team, certainly enjoyed helping pass their knowledge on. So it improved our, um, I think it improved the way that we did our training, something more structured. Um, so in all in all, it was, it was um, very positive. Um, it's possible that adding a different entry will help us provide them towards a more diverse profession simply by widening the pool of people who can apply. And I dare say, if um, perhaps the people we are prepared to employ, um, I think it's worth pointing out that barriers to entry, as in making sure that those people that call themselves archaeologists are properly qualified and competent, is not the same as barriers to recruitment. Perhaps in our rush to be taken seriously as a profession, we may have perhaps forgotten that I wonder um, just sort of going back to the previous talk um, you get an added extra because apprenticeships are a metric in measuring social value in most of the um, most of the different ways of measuring social value and it's interesting to hear about one ones that are perhaps more related to, to measuring archaeology um, there's certainly um, they're seen because they provide training and skills for young people and adults. And um, this helps to improve employment pros prospects and social mobility. Um, the social value model um, introduced by the government in 2020 or something specifically mentions apprenticeships, apprenticeships as a, 
as, a, as an example of a social value deliverable. Um, this is an example from the TOMS model used primarily by local authorities. Um, and you probably can't see it very well, but, but the, 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 the metric there is number of weeks of apprenticeships on the contract that have either been completed during the year or that will be supported by the organisation until completion. So um, social apprenticeships mean points for, for procurement, but they also have a lasting legacy. Going back a bit now, but a, a Department for Business Innovation and Skills report from July 2015 calculated that for every pound invested in a level three apprenticeship, 28 pounds was returned. So what happens next? What's the legacy? Um, I'll just finish with some of my thoughts, I think. Um, perhaps from more of an inwards looking perspective. Have we fought hard enough about how we should have shaped the profession? There's always been a place for non-graduates, but last time archaeologists came from a broad, broader base was arguably the result of the job creation schemes in the 1980s. Was our subsequent focus on archaeology as a graduate career misplaced? And did this prevent us from building a well-rounded, better structured and sustainable profession? Much of our discussion about legacy concerns the legacy of the archaeological product, but perhaps we should be um, talking more about of the inward looking legacy, the legacy that we leave as professionals for our profession. Leave it, leave it there, I think, with that, those questions. <laughs>